Welcome to today's Bible study with Pastor Josh Tice. The next time you're in Las Vegas, we'd love to meet you in person at Southern Hills. If you happen to watch us regularly, please like and subscribe to our YouTube channel and consider sharing this video with a friend. You can support the ministries of Southern Hills by visiting southernhillslv.com and clicking the Give tab. Now, sit back, relax, and get ready to learn how the Bible is relevant in your life today. Summer Vibes here at Southern Hills, and today we begin our second part of our nine-week series where we're talking about loving others. PC brought us a great sermon series all about loving God. Now today we're going to talk about how we as Christians can interact with the community around us. Specifically today we brought in a specialist, an apologist, an evangelist. He's a friend of mine. His name is Ben Shetler, and you're going to enjoy getting to know him. I'm telling you, my friend, each and every one of you are going to learn today because because he's going to deal with cultural issues and the Christian perspective. How is it that you, as a Christian, in our modern American culture, can really engage with these issues, both intelligently and spiritually? You are going to love this moment. And my hope is not only that you enjoy this presentation, but that you connect with him on social media. Without any further ado, my friend, Ben Scheller. Ben Shetland, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> He's such a funny guy. I am sorry, I'm not Josh Tice. I could never dare to be that good looking. Uh, my name's Ben Shetler, and you're stuck with me today, but I've got to tell you, it's an incredible honor to preach the truth of the Word of God, because in the pages of Scripture, in the middle of the chaos of our world, God declares His truth, and He declares so much more. He declares that He is our Savior through the person of Jesus Christ, who died on the cross and rose again. He declares that He is our Father. He is a father to the fatherless. He's a father to you. He declares that he is coming again to take the brokenness of this world and to restore it to goodness. How many are excited to be in church today? Amen. Oh man. I was, I was holding. So I, I don't know if you are aware, but, uh, in, in March of 2021, there was a new Guinness world record. Did you hear about this? The cutest baby that has ever been born. My son Cranston was a, no, I, I am a biased new dad, but grateful for him. But I was holding him in the first service. They were in here for the music. I think his mom is walking him around, but they're around. But he was in there and I was holding him and we're singing. I said, we're singing to God. I whispered, he's 15 months, so he doesn't know much, you know. We think he's a genius, but really he doesn't know much. I whispered him to God, I'm holding him in my arms. And I say, we're singing songs to Jesus. Then I said, God will be a father to you and hold you like daddy's holding you right now. Can I tell you this today, church? If you're in a difficult time and your God wants to be there and hold you, the Bible says that he is a father to you. In Romans 8, 15, the Bible says, you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. And I know there's someone that came in here today that needed to hear that. But that is not what I've been asked to preach on. All right, so we're gonna get to the meat of the word. If you take your Bibles, turn to John chapter four this morning. As Pastor Josh mentioned, my name is Ben Shetler. I run an organization called the Center for Truth in Love. And the Center for Truth and Love exists because of, because of what the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4. Now turn to John, John 4, but in Ephesians 4 verse 14, the Bible talks about a culture that's tossed back and forth to every claim to truth. And I would say that really does a good job in our culture because there's not like multiple claims of truth, right? I mean, when you go online, everything you read online is true. Uh, when you, you know, when you hear on the news, everything you hear is true, Right? That was a joke, hello? Uh, No, it is not. There's a bunch of lies in our culture. How many know there's a lot of lies? The Bible says in the middle of those lies, in verse 15, it says, but 
speaking the truth in love. Now understand, God has not called us to silence, and that's what some people think love means. That in the difficult issues of our culture, we don't say anything, but that's not a good definition of love. On the other hand, there are those people, have you heard of these people that aren't silent? They speak all the time and they're so unkind when they speak, you wish they would be silent. Have you ever run into that person before? Well, God hasn't called us to silence, but he certainly hasn't called us to unkindness. He has called us to speak truth in a loving way. And so specifically today, I have been asked to speak on how to speak the truth in love. And uh, so if I can get, there we go. Uh, If I can get this to work, we're gonna talk about understanding truth and love. How can I do that? And the Bible gives us help and hope for this specific issue. So turn to uh, John chapter four is where we're going to look today. And it's this beautiful story of the woman of Samaria. Sometimes we call her the woman of the well. And uh, we're we're going to look at how the Bible specifically uh, talks about this. But I want to start with point number one. So I have a few points today. Are you cool with that? All right, here we go. Point number one, speaking the truth in love requires us to recognize the power of God's truth to change a life. Do you know what? Sometimes I think we don't speak the truth in love because we don't realize that the truth itself has a power. We only got one amen. Uh, Let's try that again. The truth itself has a power. Well, of course, yes. We got none that time. I better stop while I'm ahead. All right. The truth has a power to, I'm sorry. Last two weeks, I preached in Shreveport, Louisiana. A church of about 4,000 people. And about every 30 seconds, they clapped. Uh, so, so it's okay to say amen. I mean, they, got, they get into their, their church. Okay, I realize we're in Vegas. We're really chill, all right? I'm cool with that. I'm cool with that. I'm, I'm, I'm good. So, uh, all right, here we go. I was trying to think of a lame uh, casino joke, but I have none. All right. And you've heard them all. So he's like, please skip over that. And I, I just want to say, hey, I, I realize, I, I, Pastor Josh is a friend of mine. He doesn't return my text, but he is a very good friend. Um, <laughs> I'm just joking, but uh, I, I'm so grateful for Pastor Josh and what he does, but I want us to be reminded, I, I know he's not here and he hasn't been here for a little while, and one, it is incredibly vital that those leading organizations um, step away for a few moments and think and plan and rejuvenate in the word. That is absolutely vital, and I want to thank you, Southern Hills, for prioritizing that, but secondly, I want to say this. Uh, Pastor Josh, as cool as he is, uh, he and I have one thing in common, and that is we don't preach from Reader's Digest or our favorite blog on the internet. We preach from the truth of the Word of God. And so we want to look to what God says this morning. And uh, so here we are, John chapter, some of you are really into it. Now I feel like I badgered you into the amen, so I'm very sorry. Uh, But John chapter four is where we're going to look this morning. Now I want to tell you a story before we get into the text, because I think it illustrates this point so well, that uh, requires us to recognize that there is power in truth. So I've shared this story here before, uh, but just really fast. Years ago, I was in Orlando and I was getting off the plane and this little girl in front of me had been told by her mother that they were going to get on a plane and go to Disney World. And I remember she was walking back and she's pulling her little, uh, you know, princess roller board. And I could tell by the way she was pulling, it was totally empty. It was just for show, but it was cute. And she's walking up the jet bridge. Well, she gets off the jet bridge and looks around. Now she was told that she was going to get on a plane and go to Disney. So where does she think she's at? So she looks around. And she sees this kiosk in the corner of the airport over there, and there's all these plush Disney toys and Disney paraphernalia and everything. And she raises her hands and she goes, Disney World. And I thought, this is just the cutest thing. Now, I'm not a creeper, but I moved really slow. Because I wanted to see how this whole thing was going to play out. So this little girl, she runs over there and she starts looking through all this stuff. And I'm just watching, not, not in a weird way. Some of you are like, huh. Uh, no, I'm just watching. And the mother there is just being patient. She's been good on the plane. Well, finally, it is time to break the hard news to this girl. And what do you think happened when that mother with great compassion said, dearest, this is not Disney. We have to go get the rental car and drive to Disney. What do you think happened? 
weeping and wailing. It was so sad. Now, I've thought about that many times. And do you know, that mother could have affirmed her truth. That's the way we say it in our culture. I mean, there's not multiple truths, but that's the way we say it. That mother could have said, well, you know, who am I to say that this isn't Disney World? Who am I to say that this is Disney World to her? Let my daughter follow her heart. Let her make her own way in the world. And imagine if she did that, one of two things would be true. Well, first of all, she would save a lot of money. (laughs) Disney's expensive. This is perfect. You can have one of everything. We would still come out ahead. So what if she did this? She said, oh yeah, this is Disney. One of two things would be true. Either one, the rest of her life, that girl would think that Disney World was a kiosk in the Orlando airport. Or two, she would discover her mother was a liar. This notion that we affirm whatever someone believes lacks power. There is power in saying, you know what? I love you. And because I love you, here is what is true. Now, in John chapter 4, Jesus does this in a very powerful way. Take your Bibles, look at John 4, and then look at the first verses here. Um, Jesus is leaving um, Judea, and uh, he is headed to the Galilee. So in verse 3, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee. This is a region uh, in the country by the Sea of Galilee or the Canaret today with mountains. It's a very beautiful region. So that's where Jesus is headed. And he must, look at verse four, and he must needs go through Samaria. Well, this is powerful because the Samaritans were hated by the Jews because of their race. Do you know that Jesus that God himself does not separate people by their skin color. He doesn't separate. In fact, Jesus said, I have to go here because I love these people the same way. God loves everyone the same way. In fact, in the book of Genesis, we find that there are only two kinds of people. And you say, man, I know the two kinds of people. There are black people and white people. Wrong. (laughs) There are two kinds. The Bible says that God made man. And everything that God had made up to that point, he had an adjective by which he described it. Do you know what it was, Genesis 1? And God saw everything that he was made, and it was very good. In fact, over and over again, in in verse 1, it's, you know, day 1 is good, day 2 is good, day 3 is good, day 4 is good, and he gets to man. And the Bible says when God sees Adam and he names all the animals that there was not found in help meet for him, and then the Bible says this, it is not good. Wait a second, what wasn't good? That man should be alone. Now, I have a rental property in Pensacola, Florida, and I have four young training Navy pilots living there, all guys. After a month they moved in, I did an inspection of the house, and I can tell you Genesis 2.18 is true. It is not good that man should be alone. How many know that's true? See, God made a different kind of person. And what is unfortunate today in our culture is we are saying that the man can be the woman or the woman can be the man. And we are removing the dividing line. And God made something very beautiful that a woman is a certain kind of person that God wants and exalts. And a man is a certain kind of person. That's where God draws the dividing line. But what we have done is we said there's no division there, but then we would create our own dividing lines and ours say based on color which is really dumb because we don't do it with hair color in fact that'd be really dangerous because some people don't have hair where do they fit in maybe they're not human (laughs) no we don't do it on eye color i've offended like people here today i'm very sorry speaking the truth and love sure you do uh We've, we've offended people, or, or we don't separate by eye color, we don't separate by hair color. Why would we do so by skin color? And can I tell you, there's one race, the human race, and there's two kinds of people in the human race. And you say, well, Ben, are you one of those people that thinks men are better than women? No. In fact, biblically, I'll tell you what the Bible says. The Bible says women are better than men. You say, what? Where is that? At being women. That's Bible right there. 
that God created women to be women. And when women try to be men, they're not good at it because they weren't designed to do it. And I'm thankful that God gave the gift of the woman. And if you think God doesn't value women, who was the one kind of person that God used to bring his son into the world? It was not a man. Who was the first people that God declared the re- resurrection to? It was not men. See, God loves women. He has a specific design and God loves men. But we break that design when we put the dividing lines in the wrong place. And Jesus says, no, no, I don't care what other people are doing. I love the Samaritans. I'm going there. But notice, not only does he love the Samaritans, he loves the most hated of the Samaritans. Here's what the Bible says that these Samaritans, that this woman who comes to the well that Jesus visits, so I must needs go through Samaria. And there's this woman that shows up and I'm, I'm just gonna give you the overview. I hope you'll take time to, to read the, the text later. But this woman shows up and come to find out she has five husbands. Is that too many? <laughs> now, I understand if, if someone passes and you remarry, but that's a lot of death. And I don't think the point of scripture is saying all these guys were dying. This woman was going from one man to the next and the guy she was with then wasn't her husband. So she was on number six. See, she was searching for something that cannot be found in a husband. She was searching for the blood of Jesus to cover her sins, but she didn't know it. And Jesus said, if you knew who you were looking for, you wouldn't be worried about water. You would be worried about living water. And then this woman gets gloriously saved. She found the man that she was looking for, Jesus. She gets gloriously saved and she runs back to the city of Samaria. And she goes to the men and she is pumped up. And do you know what she says to them? She declares Jesus and gives a credential to Jesus that demonstrates the power of speaking truth in love. Here's what it was. John chapter four, I'm gonna put the verse up here. It's verse 28 if you're looking in your scriptures. John 24 or John 4 verse 28. The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and saith to the men. Okay, what did she say? Come, see a man that has the coolest coffee shop in all of Samaria. Is that what she said? Come see a man whose light show at his church is so amazing. Come see a man that has Kona ice. I know we we have Kona ice today, right? Glory. If you came for Kona ice, I'm glad you're here, but I hope you'll stay for Jesus. She said, look at this credential. Come see a man which told me all the things that ever I did is not this, the Christ. Understand the credential she gave to Jesus is he said, look, you shouldn't be with all of these men. You were wrong and you need something better. Can I tell you the truth has a power to change lives? And when we are silent, when we don't speak it, we are not being loving. See, oftentimes we get this idea, well, well, you know, if I just stay over here and be silent, you know, people will like me. And that is not the goal of truth. The goal of truth is it is a power to change lives. Let me tell you a story about how a life was saved because someone, actually multiple someones were willing to speak truth. Young lady in Destin, Florida, not far from where I live, she wakes up one morning and verifies what she was very concerned might be true. She had a a baby and did not know who the father was and had no idea how she was going to take care of it. Imagine the anguish. My heart goes out to her all. And so what she decided to do, she goes, no, father, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm going to have to get rid of this baby. Now understand that baby, even at a very young age, is a precious life bearing the image of God. And so she said, what can I do? And she went online and found out that there was a pill she could take that would kill this baby. So she calls all around Destin to find a doctor. She couldn't find anyone there. She calls Tallahassee, which is about two hours away. All there, couldn't find a doctor there. Calls all the way over to Jacksonville, four and a half hour drive. Finally finds a doctor that will prescribe her this pill and drive four and a half hours. 
course. Imagine the anguish of a mother who feels like this is her only option. And can I tell you, if you're a mother in here and feel that way, this church would love to help you. In fact, if you look at all these seats, some people say, well, you know, these pro-life people, they only care about one issue. No, if you came in here this morning, every seat talks about how we care about children all over the world <laughs> and how we're helping them. So it's just not true. But, but at any rate, um, she drives over, the, over there. She's prescribed the pill. She takes the medication and drives back. Now, what happens is as much like a, a hose that has water in it, uh, when, when a woman becomes pregnant, there is progesterone that is pumped into the body and it's kind of like the, the life factor, much like you need, you know, you turn on your hose, that water comes out, it saves the life of your plants. Here that progesterone comes into her body and it's saving the baby, but that pill turns it off. What happens when your plants in the desert don't get any water? That's exactly what was happening to this baby. She's driving across and all of a sudden she sees a sign. The sign is a picture of an unborn baby, and it says, choose life. It broke that mother's heart. She thought, what have I done? She continues driving and sees a second sign. She's so overcome, she pulls off the road and starts Googling, how do I reverse an abortion pill? She comes to the very first website she comes to is my friend, Dr. Bill Lyle. He's a certified OBGYN. He's the chair of, of uh, that department at Sacred Heart Hospital. And he specializes, in addition to bringing life in the world, specializes in reversing the abortion pill. And just like you can turn that progesterone off, if you put more in, it's like a flood of life turning it back on. So he calls her his office. He answers the phone. And uh, she tells him what has happened, and he says, we can get you some help. He calls a pharmacist in Destin, where this young woman lived, and the pharmacist answered. Now, sadly, there are some pharmacists that are against this, and the pharmacist, he says, I'd like this particular prescription, and the pharmacist says, are you attempting to, to reverse the effects of an abortion pill? And Dr. Lyle says, well, he's like, oh, man, this could be a problem. And he says, yes, I am. And the voice on the other line was a woman, and she said, I have heard about this procedure but have never gotten to be a part of it. I'm going to pay for this medication. The woman shows up to the pharmacy, announces who she is. The pharmacist comes around, gives her a massive hug, gives her free medication, and she starts taking it months later. That baby was born perfectly fine. Why? Because someone had the courage to speak truth in love and put a big billboard up and say, here's what is true. And that power, a baby is alive today because of the power of truth. You say, well, did we just leave the mother? Oh, no. There's, you, you have no idea, if you're not aware, that there are centers around this nation all over the place that are supporting these mothers and walking through them. If you're not aware, you need to start giving to some of these centers to help these mothers out. I, I'm telling you, the truth has a power to change lives. Man, I don't know about you, but I am so thankful that our Supreme Court said states can now decide what is good for a mother. And now we as believers must speak what is true in our own state to save lives. All right. So, so here's, what, here's what happens in, verse, uh, in chapter 4, verse 39, if you keep reading. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman. What was the saying which testified? He told me all that ever I did. Can I tell you, believers, do not be afraid to give clarity to truth. But there's some more to this that I want you to give. There's a power in truth, but there's some more of this. Number two, speaking the truth requires us to accept the authority of God as the creator and ruler and his word as the truth for his world. In other words, I, I, you know, I've seen some of this debate that God is the authority. Why? Because he's true. Do you know what? If you're just discussing your opinion, it's the same as your neighbors. Everybody has an opinion. I'm not worried about opinions. I must be worried about truth. And who gets to decide what is true? Well, the Democrats do, Ben. Whatever they say, that's true. 
That's what some people think. Well, who gets to decide what's true? Well, it is the Republicans that decide what is true. No, no, who gets to decide what is true? Well, Ben, there's this thing called intersectionality. And the person that is, that is, you know, the most marginalized for society, they decide what is true and everyone. Can I tell you, no man decides what is true. The creator gets to decide what is true. He made the world, so he decides it. Look at this verse in Psalm 100, verse 3. It says, it is he that hath made us and not we ourselves. Therefore, he decides what is true. What is real, Ben? It is the world that God made. Now, I like to think of this. I think the physical world is more like an avatar to the spiritual world. You say, what do you mean by that? The most real thing in the universe is the spirit, not the flesh. That's the most real. Some people say, well, but you know, what's the most real? But, but the flesh is what God created for us to, in the spirit, live in this world. And so God decides what is true. And do you know the number of people that think that they made themselves? Well, I made myself, so I get to decide what is true. And no, no, when we think about speaking the truth in love, we must humble ourselves and say, God, what does your word say? You know what? You won't speak the truth if you think it is your truth. But you will speak it if it's God's truth. Let me give you an example of this. I was in a debate and uh, uh, with with an athe- an LGBTQ activist who's an atheist, and uh, I, I it was about fifty minutes into the debate, and we were going back and forth. And she goes, "You know what you believe is just bigoted." And I said, "Well, well, Shannon, first of all, I'm not a bigot because I love everybody, I, and, and I do. And whether you believe me or not is up to you. But I'm telling you, at the bottom of my heart, I I hope and desire to love anybody, whether they're LGBTQ, white, black, you know, whatever label you want to put on yourself. I believe that the label that God puts is His image on you, that you're an image bearer, and that's why I love you. So I love everybody. And I said, you know, you're over here. I'm like, I've been nothing but nice and kind as we've had this whole discussion." Discussion, I said, but understand, this isn't my belief. This is what God's word says. I'm just telling you what God says. And I said, if I'm nice and kind to tell you what God says, am I still a bigot? Long pause. She thinks about it. And then she says, yes, you're a bigot. And she goes, but I understand you have a huge problem because you believe what God says and what God's word says is final. And she goes, that's a huge problem, but yes, you are a bigot. Understand that sometimes just because you believe what the Bible says and you're nice, there are people that will call you a bigot, but they're not calling you a bigot. They're saying that to God because it's his word. You say, if I really love you, I'm gonna speak what is true. We have to understand he's the authority. I'm not. And when we go to people say, well, I'm going to tell you what I think. Uh, 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 Who cares? No offense. (laughs) Uh, We need to know what God says. And I've got to be a speaker of what God says. All right. Um, And and I want to give you a a good example of that. that. Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning, Ben Shetler created the heavens. That's not what it says, does it? God created the heavens and the earth. Uh, Sometimes Cranston thinks he created everything. He did not. And his dad makes him aware that, no, okay. Speaking the truth in love requires us to possess a knowledge of God's word that can be applied to the situations or untruth you are encountering. Now, sometimes I believe people don't speak because they don't think the truth has power. Sometimes I think we don't speak because we give our opinion instead of the word of God. But sometimes I think we don't speak because we don't know how the Bible applies to the situation. Do you know what the Bible says in 1 Peter 3.14? It's talking, Peter is writing to suffering Christians and he says, but and if you suffer for righteousness sake. Do you know there's some preachers that will tell you if you follow what God says, everything will be perfect in your life and that is not biblical. Well, you're just going to have prosperity no matter what you do. That's not in the Bible. Now, here's what the Bible does say. that the Yet have I seen the, the righteous forsaken nor a seed begging bread. There are principles that I can follow that, that if I do what God says in his world, there will be blessing. Don't get me wrong. But there will also be people that even while you are experiencing the blessing of God, that will still persecute you. Have you seen this a little bit in our world? Like being called a bigot for saying what God says? It says, but if you suffer for righteousness sake, 
fall into Great Depression. It says, happy are ye. Oh, I'm sorry, I used the old King James. Happy are you, that's what ye means. Happy are you. And be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. Now, why do people get troubled? I'll tell you why. It is because they don't know what to say. I'm talking to other people. I know everybody in here knows what to say, but other people. Look at verse 1 Peter 3.15, the next verse. But sanctify the Lord God in your heart and be ready always to give an answer for the hope that is in you with gentleness and respect, with meekness and fear. Now notice this in verse 16. Having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. Here's what he's saying. When people start saying unkind things to you, the natural response is to go, ooh, maybe I shouldn't have said that. That's the natural response, right? Somebody gets up in your face, like the kids say, they get up in your grill. That always makes me hungry when they say that. (laughs) Stay out of my grill, I'm cooking hot dogs. They get up in your face. Blake and I are having a moment up here. All right. Uh, when they, when they get, the natural reaction is to go, oh, you know what? Maybe I shouldn't have said that. Now, sometimes that may be true. <laughs> it's possible that we can say the right thing at the wrong time. But sometimes we have to step by. And if we know that it was right, we can have a good conscience. We can say, you know what? Hey, this is what is true. And But if we don't know the truth, we can't have a good conscience. Let, let me contextualize this issue. Do you know the truth of life? You may say, why, Ben, wait a second. Why is abortion wrong? Because don't you care about women's right to choose? Oh, absolutely. I care about a woman's right to choose. Ah, uh, that's why I don't believe in abortion. You say, well, hang on, what do you mean? Well, first of all, from the moment of conception, the Bible teaches us that the baby is alive because in the book of Jeremiah, the Bible says that I knew you in the womb and formed you in the womb. That that was a person before he was ever born. But we go on, that the Bible says from creation that man is different than all the animals, that he is created in the image of God. Have you ever seen someone burn an American flag? Has that ever bothered you? It's this visceral image of going like, oh, wow, they're burning the flag. Why does it bother you? Is the flag America? No, it's the image of America. What is abortion? Is an attack on the image of God. That that baby bears God's image, and when it is destroyed, it destroys God's image in the world. The baby is not God, but he bears the image of God. So we see that the baby is alive uh, in the mother's womb. We see that it's an attack on the image of God. But then you say, well, what about personal autonomy? Understand that the baby inside the mom is a person that has rights too. Women do not become men when they have a male baby. Do they? They don't. Well, then how can a baby have a boy without becoming a man, it's a separate body. So I believe in the right to choose. I just also believe in the baby's right to choose. Now, what does that mean? That means that I have to support this mom who's going through a difficult thing. Now, I don't believe in dads abandoning babies. I don't believe in that. The people say, oh, you know what? If we're gonna make laws that don't allow mothers to kill their babies, then we need to make laws that keep men in the lives of their children. I accept your terms. I'm okay with that. Dad should be supporting the baby. It's their baby. But you know, when the dad steps out, the church can be there and say, hey, I support you. And don't believe the lie that the church isn't because we are in so many places. All right, but we have to know how to contextualize this truth. Let me give you one more thing when it comes to life. Dr. Lyle, my friend, Dr. Lyle, he says this, he was speaking to a bunch of med students and he goes, let's talk about patients' rights for a second. He goes, you're med students, you believe patients have rights? Yes, he goes, let me give you a scenario. There's a person living in the United States that needs life-saving surgery. 
but they were not born in the United States. Do you give the surgery? The students are like, oh, you're such a bigot. Are you one of those people that believes, you know, undocumented people shouldn't be able to get surgery? And he goes, no, no, no. Let me explain this a little further. The, the person who is living in the United States has not been born yet. It's still a baby. Does that patient have right? Well, I believe all patients have rights, uh, regardless of their documentation status. I believe they all have rights to have life-saving surgery. And I think we could all agree at that as Christians that we'd agree with that. But certainly if the baby can have surgery on it, it is a patient. And if it's a patient, it's a separate person and it has rights. We have to be able to articulate the Bible's truth in a way that people can understand. Do you see what I'm saying? That's speaking truth in love. All right. Um, You say, Ben, why do you keep bringing this issue up? Because the Supreme Court said it's the state's decision now, and now the state of Nevada has the opportunity to say, we believe in life. And what it needs is faithful Christians to stand up and say, I believe in life. You say, oh, that couldn't happen. That's what so many people said about Roe. It'll never be overturned 50 years later. The Holy Spirit of God stepped in the Supreme Court and declared what is true. And they sent it back to the states. And now it's our time to have a voice. All right. I'm sorry. I'm thankful. You say, why? Why are you so thankful for this? What about these mothers? Oh, we want to love them. But at the same time, here's what I want you to understand. Yesterday, scheduled abortions in Arkansas were all canceled across the state. Oh, man, praise the Lord. Babies that were set to die are alive right now. That's why I get excited. All right. So that's something worth clapping about. All right. Very good. Don't tell Pastor Josh we clapped in his church. Okay. So we have to have the right knowledge. Speaking the truth in love requires us to be patient in our timing and creative in our wording. We have to be careful with the way that we say the book of James talks about this. Um, but also Ecclesiastes three, verse seven, you know what? There's a time to speak. There's a time when you're on a crowded plane, you don't have to, oh, I've got to speak the truth. No, no, there's an appropriate time. You're going to crash that plane. Uh, you know, there, you have to build a relationship with people. Don't just go shooting your mouth off in a, con- some of you, don't, don't go, don't go out to the restaurant and be yelling all stuff out where people don't understand the context by which you're saying it. There's an appropriate time to say things. There's also an inappropriate, you know, there's also, there's no time. And, and so at some point you have to speak, but I'm saying there's an appropriate time. I love what James says. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to say whatever he feels like. No, it says be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, that that the speaking that we do is out of a foundational relationship that I have with a person and it's done in love. Um, And it gets, in this we have to use discernment for it. Now, Uh, Let me contextualize all of this in a story that may be helpful to you. Ben, how do I speak truth in a loving way? Well, several years ago, um, I was asked by the the, uh, uh, television network A&E to be on a pilot television show that they were doing on religious diversity. And I was so excited. I went to my wife. I'm like, oh, I get to be on TV. And um, uh, she said, well, you know, that's really great. But what if they ask you what the Bible says about marriage? Because that's not very popular. And I was like, oh, you worry too much. You know, they're not going to ask me about that. Well, I show up to the interview. There's five people there. The associate producer of the show, she said, hey, I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions. If you don't like anyone, you can pass. I'm like, perfect. We cover it. So they start the interview, and about 30 minutes in, she asked me this very pointed question. She said, what would you tell a 16-year-old boy that comes to you and says, I think I'm gay, what would you say to him? Pass. Next question, please. What do you got? I don't want to answer that question. I sat there thinking about, oh man, I thought about myself and I thought, you know what? People are going to think of me if I answer this question on live television. But then the Holy Spirit of God spoke to me and said, Ben, this isn't about you. And can I tell you, speaking the truth in love isn't about us. It's about the other person. So I thought, you know what? I need to say something. But I wanted to do so with wisdom and with carefulness. It was the right time. It wasn't time to pass. It was time to speak. So here's what I said. I said, first of all, I want to step into a story because I don't know this young man. And I'm just going to start speaking stuff at him until I know his story. So I want to be patient and step into a story and learn from him. But then secondly, I said, I think what you're asking is, well, what about a person that is attracted to the opposite sex? But, well, what do we do? And I said, here's what I would say. I said, there's a part of me that in my flesh and in my sinfulness 
would say it would be easier for me and some of the friends I know if God would just change his mind. That would be easier for me. But who am I to tell the creator of the universe what is right and what is wrong? So what I would want to do is take that young man to the truth of the word of God and find out what God says about humanness and attraction. And the best thing for his life would be to know what God says. I'll never forget at the end of that interview, the director of photography came up to me. I didn't know this at the time. I found out later. He was a gay man. And did he come up to me and call me a bigot? He literally came up to me with tears in his eyes and said, I want to Thank you for what you said. See, I promise you, church, not every person, but many people, if you will have the compassion to speak the power into someone's life, that God could use you to be a change maker in their life. Will you be a speaker of truth in a loving way? I hope you will. Heads bowed and eyes closed just for a moment. Let me say this with heads bowed and eyes closed. To the mother in here, and there may be several, that says, you know what, Ben? I've had an abortion. Can I say something to you from the truth of the word of God? That all sin, every single sin, all sin, hear me, mother, all sin is covered under the blood of Jesus Christ to those who have repented. Do not for a second Allow the devil to get a stronghold of guilt and shame in your life for something you have been forgiven for. Don't allow it for a second. Don't leave here in church today feeling depressed or down. Leave here knowing that there is great love and forgiveness with God. Don't allow the devil a second into your life. Let me say this, and I know we got to get going. How many today would say, you know what, Ben? I need to be faithful or more faithful in this area of speaking truth and love. Ben, I need to learn some more. Ben, I need to I need to be in the word some more. Ben, I need to have some more courage to do it. Whatever it is, or Ben, I I speak it, but I need to be more loving. Maybe there's an area that God spoke to you today. If that's you, would you just slip your hand up and I'll pray for you. Several, praise the Lord. Father, would uh, you see these hands? Heavenly Father, I pray that you'll work in this time. Father, do not allow a mother to leave here feeling guilt. Let her experience your forgiveness and great love. And Father, don't allow us to leave here unprepared to speak your truth. Might we be followers of you that have great compassion, but understand how powerful the truth can be in a life. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, I would be remiss if I did not give you some equipping. In fact, this is actually what Pastor Josh asked me to do. So he said, Ben, I want you to come and I want you to connect people to your ministry because you're answering questions all the time that, you know, I can't turn around every five seconds and answer them. So one of the best ways to get connected to our ministry is to text the word prepared to the number 33777. When you do that, I will send you a free book on how to speak the truth in love. This is a 14-day devotional guide. If you say, I'm not much of a reader, great. This book has videos with it. It is a really cool and unique book. And so I challenge you to get that. That will also sign you up to be connected to our ministry. Um, And then another way to follow us in that book is absolutely free. Another way to follow us is at our website, the Center for Truth and Love. We have a television show that's syndicated on DISH and DirecTV. You can find archived episodes of that television show there, along with some other very powerful videos that will help you speak truth in love. Also our social media, Facebook and Twitter. Many of you follow me there, but if you don't, uh, I'm putting resources and stuff there all the time. One more resource that's available to you is our gospel evidences resource. That is available outside. That is a nine lesson resource that will equip you on how do I give an answer for God exists? How do I give an answer for the Bible is true and reliable? How do I give an answer for, well, God is loving. Why would he allow evil? How do I give an answer for Jesus rose from the dead? Every single one of those comprises the gospel and we have answers in that gospel evidences resource. It's about six hours, nine lessons, and that is available for a donation of 
any amount. We typically say you could think between $25 and $35, but if you want to give 100 we will allow it. If you, you say, I only got five bucks, that's fine too. Whatever you would like to donate, that is available out there. Uh, Southern Hills, thank you so much for the great honor of stepping in for your pastor this, this Sunday. It has been a real privilege uh, to get to know you. I'll be out there in the back. Michael. Thank you for watching Josh Tice's most recent Bible sermon. If you think of someone who may enjoy this one, go ahead and send it or post it today. If you're ever in Las Vegas on Sunday, we'd love for you to stop by Southern Hills and see us in person. If you benefit from this virtual ministry, we'd also like to encourage you to support our gospel efforts by sending a donation to the ministries of Southern Hills. You can do so by visiting southernhillslv.com and clicking the Give tab.